Welcome to Winchester Cafe Sci Online and a special welcome to those joining us for the first time. A recording of this talk will be posted on our YouTube channel where you'll find recordings of all our online talks. You can also find the links on our website. If you enjoyed tonight's talk and you're not on our mailing list, you can sign up for it there to be notified about future talks. After tonight's talk, we'll go straight into the Q&A, so please put any questions into the chat and I'll read them out, and that includes our viewers on YouTube. After graduating with a degree in biochemistry from Bed Bedford College, University of London, tonight's speaker went on to do a PhD on fungal virus genetics. He then went on to his first postdoc at St Mary's Hospital Medical School on human genetics. After a couple of years, he went on to another postdoc at St George's Hospital Medical School to study Crohn's disease. He went on to investigate the role of mycobacteria in the disease, work which took him to the University of Surrey, where he gained a lectureship in molecular microbiology, working first on paratuberculosis in cows and humans, then tuberculosis and meningococcal meningitis in humans. His group now specialised in using systems-based approaches to study infectious disease. He wrote the popular science book Quantum Evolution, published in the UK by HarperCollins in 2001. The book examines the role of quantum mechanics in life, evolution and consciousness. He also writes articles regularly for The Guardian newspaper in the UK on topics as varied as quantum mechanics, evolution and genetically modified crops, and occasionally reviews books for The Guardian. His new book, Life is Simple, highlights the role of simplicity in science and particular its favourite tool, Occam's Razor. So please welcome Professor John Joe McFadden. Thank you, William, and um, uh, thank you all of the Winchester um, Science Cafe team uh, for inviting me to speak here today. Um, I, can hear a, I can hear something else going on in the background. Uh, okay, it's gone now. Thanks. <laughs> Excellent. So, and now life is simple. So how Occam's Razor sets science free and unlock the universe. And what I'll say at the beginning is I'm fine to be interrupted to ask any particular questions at particular points where um, something isn't clear. But let's um, move on through the talk. Okay, so William of Ockham, um, <clears throat> born in 1288 or around that time in the village of Ockham in Surrey, and not so far from either Winchester or um, or the University of Surrey, Guildford, where I work. Um, here it is here in London, just to orientate you. Okay, so most famous for the phrase entities should not be multiplied beyond necessity, Occam's razor, which asks you to accept only the simplest solutions to problems. So here's a little bit more of his history. He studied university at the University of Oxford around uh, 1320. Um, he studied theology, which was then known as the Queen of Sciences. Uh, and we'll be coming to why theology was considered a science um, in uh, the 13th and 14th century shortly. Um, uh, in fact, we'll come to it now. <laughs> Theological science. What, uh, how was theology a science? Well, the textbook of theology in the Middle Ages was called Lombard Sentences. And it asked lots of questions um, that we would consider today to be theology and straightforwardly so, in what manner, a kind of manner is free will accepted in God, whether it would be of been fitting that God assume the womanly gender, so in gender politics was up there in the 14th century. Well, it, but then they go, then curious kind of questions, which are kind of a mixture of, of theology and science as it was known in the Middle Ages at least, whether the angels were composed out of matter and form, whether the firmament is the same as the element of fire. Again, these are kind of halfway between them, whether the firmament is the same as the element of fire, clearly asking a question about what the sky was made of, what the, um, uh, what the world outside the earth was made of, and that's kind of a scientific question. And on that point, um, I'm going to ask you to think for a moment uh, about the sky, because the sky really was opened up science. Um, in uh, It was really the only science of the ancient world, the study of the sky. And um, 
some of the aspects of it are, are, are not as obvious today as they would have been to people in the medieval world or the ancient world. We see here uh, the sky at night and uh, full of stars. You can see the Milky Way, of course. And one of the um, things we know is that, um, well, uh, well, one of the things that uh, an ancient person would have known, but perhaps we don't know, and I won't ask people to interrupt at this stage, but just think for a moment and see if you know the answer. What happens to the stars when you're not looking at them? Do they just stay where they are? Or do they move? And if so, how do they move? Okay, that's question isn't so obvious to us today because we don't really stay out at night and see the star, or at least not where, without street lighting, etc., where uh, stars aren't so visible. We don't stare at it. But say in the ancient world, in places like Babylon, where astronomy, where astrology and astronomy were um, first uh, recorded, they slept on their roofs at night and they stared at the stars. So they knew that most of the stars went around in perfect circles. And those perfect circles centered upon the North Star. So that was a kind of puzzle in itself. What were they doing going around in perfect circles? How, how, they were, how were they managing that? Well, the answer to that puzzle in the ancient world tended to be on this kind of grounds, it depended different to whether it was from Babylon or Egypt or, or this is the Greek version, which then made its way to the uh, medieval world, is that the stars were pinned onto spheres. And here's the one of the uh, spheres. This is the uh, primum mobile, the uh, sphere of the fixed stars. So this was thought to be a crystal sphere that surrounded the Earth upon which the stars were pinned. So this sphere rotated, and that rotation turned all the stars. So they moved around in perfect circles around the Earth. Perfectly reasonable and sensible explanation. Uh, similarly, the sun was um, was uh, the sun and moon were uh, attached to. Um, spheres, and that rotated them. Um, interestingly, although this is all, uh, the Earth was, of course, at the center of it all, sensibly enough, everything rotated around the Earth, so the Earth must be at the center. Um, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't as geocentric as, as Diablo-centric, because, of course, at least in the Christian world, the center of the Earth was hell. Uh, if you went down to the, that's where hell was located, beneath you. Heaven was above you and hell was beneath you. So the whole physical cosmos was theology in action, really. God was above you, hell was below you. And while you were on the earth, your job was to make sure that when you finished on the, your time on the earth, you went up rather than down. So the whole, whole business of life in the universe was really a theological one. Um, now, you've got planets here uh, as well, Saturn, Earth, and we'll come to a moment, how did they know which, which of the stars were planets? We'll come to that question in a moment. Um, so, theology in the sky. So, in the medieval world, it, this illustrates a view that if you could kind of climb above above the buildings, above the, uh, um, uh, above the uh, uh, into the heavens, you could eventually come to one of the uh, crystal uh, spheres. And if you poke through it, your head through it, you would see the stars, you would see the planets, you may even see the angels, they were also up there, they were in heaven, this was heaven. You have to remember that the heavens were called heaven for a reason, they were the gates of heaven, beyond them was the angels, the saints, and God. And if you could poke your head through the Prima Mobile, you may see the face of God. So God was looking down at you all the time from the heavens. The stars were the decorations of the walls of heaven. So you lived in a world that was enclosed entirely in a theological context. Now, I ask you to think about the planets. How do you know which ones are planets? Um, and uh, I hope some of you know the answer, but if you don't know the answer, it's because planets didn't move in perfect circles. 
So the fixed stars, as they were called, they were called fixed stars because they thought to be fixed to the uh, sphere, to the fixed uh, sphere of the fixed stars. And they all moved in perfect circles, but the planets didn't. So, and not only did it, so they had these paths like this that kind of wandered through the constellations. And this is where we get the constellations in astrology, because the constellations are those, um, uh, oh, oh, this is where we get the, um, the horoscope constellations, those like Taurus and Sagittarius, etc. cetera. Um, uh, uh, and astrology really is, is about following the path of the planets through these constellations. And the other peculiar thing about the paths of the planets, not only did they not travel in perfect circles, but kind of wheeled around the heavens. So they were called wandering stars, but sometimes they turned circle. They, they went backwards and then went forwards again. So they were very erratic, and like the fixed stars, which moved in perfect circles, the planets were very erratic. So how, do you, how did you account for those? Um, we'll come back to that question. Uh, now, how theology became a science? So uh, largely to do with the Thomas Aquinas, the great Italian theologian, who really did a lot to many other theologians were involved in this, but incorporating Aristotle's philosophy, which had been rediscovered in the early medieval world, um, rediscovered and uh, incorporated into Western philosophy and indeed theology. Because, for example, Aquinas used Aristotle's science to provide five proofs of God. And he attempted to really fuse theology and science to create a kind of scientific theology. So uh, closest uh, that I could think of would be um, uh, in, uh, in fiction, really, where um, you get this kind of idea that science and theology are, are the same thing. Uh, so theology became the queen of sciences because it was a science that could lead you most directly to God. So one of the parts of the theological science was Aquinas' five ways, his proofs of God. Now, I'm sure most of you are familiar with most of, of them, they're kind of familiar with Western philosophy, the unmoved mover, that everything that moves is this, of course, comes from Aristotle, everything that moves is moved by another. And if you follow that backwards in time, you must come to a first mover, who can only be God. Similarly, the first cause, the everything that is caused must have a cause. Everything that happens must have a cause. And those causes must have their own causes. So you must keep going back. You get to the first cause, okay? It must be God. Um, I won't go through all of them, but one of them I'll mention because it's very important for science. The telo, um, no, sorry, the, um, the final cause. Um, final cause, which is called the teleological argument. So Aristotle ha was had a different notion of cause than we would have today. Uh, all of the causes that we think of today are things that happened in the past. Aristotle also had causes in the future. For example, the cause of uh, acorns, the reason they existed was to feed pigs or other animals. The reason pigs existed, the cause the teleological cause, the telos of pigs was to feed humans. The medieval Christian world went one step further and said the reason for humans, the telos of humans was to worship God. So everything in the world had a cause and those causes ultimately led to God. But so by studying the causes, you were studying God. So as I said, everything in the world was saturated with teleology and thereby this scientific theology, because if you wanted to study, for example, a lion, the first thing you knew about, need to know about a lion was it was there. It's telos was there to provide an example to man of courage. If you wanted to uh, study a pelican, you needed to know that it was there to provide an example of sacrifice because um, the pelican was thought to feed its young by um, using its beak to pierce its own uh, breast. And the fox was there as an example of wildness, as a warning to mankind. So everything, the entire world, 
was saturated with theology. And this is not only was theology above um, mankind um, in the heavens, it was below mankind in hell, and it was everywhere on the planet. So it was saturated everything. And another, and another important importation from Aristotle that created a lot of confusion and occupied a lot of uh, manuscripts for many centuries is universals. So this came from some Aristotle, who asked the question, for example, what makes round objects round? Uh, actually, Plato first asked this question, and Aristotle re, um, rejigged the answer a bit, but it's basically the same, that uh, all round objects have what he called a universal of roundness. Plato called it a form of roundness. Similarly, every square objects have a universal of squareness. Every wooden object has a universal of woodenness, just as gold objects have a universal of goldness. Cherries have a universal of redness and, and sweetness and so on, and tunas because they come in pairs. So science in the medieval world was all about extracting these universals, finding out what the universal of everything was, and studying these different universals. And the reason why it was so important and why it was still theological was because all of these universals were thought to be ideas in God's mind. So the whole reality of the universe was really a path to God again. If you knew what the universals were, when you knew a little bit of God's mind, therefore um, that was why science was the queen, sorry, theology was the queen of sciences. So William of Ockham uh, went to Oxford and, and um, things didn't go well. So he studied theology around 1320, but didn't complete his degree because he was accused of teaching heresy. And we'll see why in a moment. He was summoned to Avignon, where, which was the papal seat at the time, to answer charges of heresy, teaching heresy before Pope John XXII. He then got em uh, embroiled in another argument. This was a conflict, and we won't have time to go into this, but it's a very fascinating conflict between the Pope and the Franciscans about the nature of poverty. If anyone's read Umberto Eco's Name of the Rose, beautiful, wonderful book, or even seen the film with uh, Sean Connery, this is what the book and the film opens with, this conflict between the Pope and the Franciscans over the nature of poverty. We won't go into it, but what happened was William of Ockham got embroiled in it. He then accused the Pope of being a heretic on the basis of what the Pope had said about poverty and holiness. And this, of course, the Pope essentially came down to him saying that um, the Pope was saying, it's okay to be holy, I'm the wealthiest man in the world, and um, uh, it's okay to be rich. I'm the wealthiest man in the world, and I'm also the holiest man in the world. William disagreed and called it heresy. And that was a dangerous thing to do, call a Pope a heretic in the medieval world. So he had to flee Amnion, chased by a posse of papal soldiers, uh, and escaped to the protection of the Holy Roman Emperor. Okay, so that's briefly his life. But why was he accused of heresy? Well, the first thing he did was really dismantle all of Aquinas' so-called proofs of God. For example, the unmoved mover argument. Well, he kind of came up with the idea of a perpetual motion machine where one object can cause another to move, can cause another to move, and so on and so forth, until the last object causes the first one to move. So you don't need a it can't you don't need a prime mover. Everything could just move each other. So that was uh, one way of undermining the unmoved mover argument. He also insisted. He said also came up with another argument, which was, well, if God doesn't need if if you're saying everything needs a mover, well, what about God? If God doesn't need need a mover, well, why can't the universe not need a mover either, a first mover either? So he. He tied all of these Aristotle's, um, Aristotle, sorry, Aquinas's proofs of God in knots and showed that none of them actually work. And um, and the final one for uh, teleolo teleology, it um, uh, in the Enlightenment they claimed they decimated teleology. 
William of Ockham did this several centuries beforehand. Uh, this is uh, what he wrote about teleology. So teleology is the idea that everything is a final cause. So remember, this is very odd compared to our notion of causes today, because these causes were in the future. All of the causes that we think about today are in the past, but teleology has causes in the future. You know, the cause of pigs is to be eaten by humans. And you can't un understand the cause unless you know what their future is. So that makes them inaccessible to science because we don't have access to the future. So teleology is the, um, the bane of science. So anyway, what William said was someone who is just following natural reason would claim that the question why is inappropriate in the course of natural actions. For example, for a fire, what reason is a fire generated, you might ask? Why does the fire heat the wood rather than um, cool it? Um, William just says, that's its nature. That's what wood does. That's what fires do. They don't need a cause. That's just the way they are. And from that stems pretty much most of modern science. As to the universals, all of these universals, this is where the Occam's razor comes in, all these invisible universals that were meant to underpin the reality of everything. And the theological scientists, if you like, of the Middle Ages spent all their time studying them because they had clues to God. William wiped them out. He said, no, they don't exist. None of them exist. And he used his razor to eliminate them for various arguments, but he just said, Keep it simple. You don't need them to explain any, anything. So let's get rid of them. Uh, entities shouldn't be multiplied. There's no evidence that uh, universals exist. So get rid of them. And then if you want to study an object, you don't go looking for its universals. You study the object itself. And from that, all of modern science follows. Instead of looking at chasing invisible um, entities, invisible essences of objects, you study the object itself. That's modern science. But also what it did was undermine this connection between science and theology. If the universals aren't, don't exist, then how do you find out about God? If teleology doesn't work, there's no telos, there's no theological causes, how do you find out about God? Ockham said, you can't. You cut the cord between science and theology forever. He's, so there was no point then in the scholastics, the theological scientists, if you like, studying science because that didn't lead them to God anymore. So he planted a wedge really then between science and religion insisted that the articles of Christian faith should be accepted as such. They cannot be proved by reason, nor can they be made, made the basis of knowledge. Science and theology are essentially different and must not be confused. So essentially, William of Ockham was saying that science is about reason and not theology. Religion and theology are about faith and not science and should not be confused. As far as I'm aware, he is the first person in the history of the entire world to make that statement. All of modern science, pretty much all of the secular world that we live in today is based on that principle that you don't mix science with theology. And how many people know that the first person to make that statement was William of Ockham? So I think he's an extraordinarily gifted and brilliant um, thinker who we know very little about. Anyway, so he did have influence in the Middle Ages. He, his philosophy inspired what was called the Via Moderna, which was this, um, uh, the elements of his philosophy that uh, I've discussed already, elimination of universals, elimination of teleology, preference for simple solutions, separation of science from religion, and that swept through the universities of Europe in the Middle Ages, although we don't really know about it now, but people like Martin Luther claimed that Occam is my teacher. So he was extraordinarily influential in the Middle Ages, but then he's been pretty much forgotten. Occam's razor in science. So what, um, this, uh, what did it do? This principle that entities should not be multiplied beyond necessity. 
Well, remember the stars at night? How do you explain them? And of course, how it was explained in the medieval world was the Earth at the center and the stars surrounding it on their crystal sphere, uh, the sun and the moon similarly on their spheres, and then the planets. Um, they were made of a different element, ether or quintessence, although William of Ockham disputed that. Um, I'll come to that in a moment. But remember, there's the planets. The planets, how do you get the planets to move in their peculiar way if they're on these spheres? Because anything on a sphere, no matter what you do with it, unless you move the sphere, which you can't do in this system, it will travel in a perfect circle. Planets don't do that. They travel in these weird paths. How do you make them do that? Now, in the ancient world, the last great astronomer of the ancient world, Claudius Ptolemy, came up with this very complicated system in which not only were the planets on spheres, but they were on kind of wheels attached to the spheres. And those wheels went round in circles, within circles, within circles. So it was a very complicated system, but he managed to make it work. So it could be used to predict the motion of the planets. Ptolemy's was a very mathematical, geometric kind of system, but it worked. And it was geocentric, it still had the Earth as its center, but it was very complicated. Now, to get rid of a lot of the motions of the planets of the, um, in the sky, the first step was to realize that the Earth spins. So remember the first thing that all the stars and planets and, uh, and everything in the sky does in the medieval world from their perspective was spins around the earth every day. Somebody said this, just as it is better to save the appearance, this is what they meant by the save the appearance of the sky to try to make sense of it through fewer causes than many, Occam's razor essentially, it is better to say that the earth which is very small, is moved most rapidly than the highest sphere, the one carrying the stars, is at rest. So here, somebody was saying that actually, let's make the sky, the motions in the sky simpler by allowing the earth to spin, rather than having everything spinning around the earth every day. Who said that? Someone called Jean Buridan, a Parisian alchemist in 1340. So while Occam was still alive, he was using arguments from Occam's philosophy, Occam's razor, to argue that it was simpler to allow the Earth to spin than all of the planets, stars, sun, moon, etc., to rotate around every day. Who else made that start, his starting point? Copernicus. So the first thing that Copernicus did when he looked at what he called the monstrous, the monstrous, uh, the monstrous monstrous complexity of the Ptolemaic system, first thing he did was let's make the earth spin. And once he did that, everything became much simpler. And then he could look for an even simpler solution. And because my screen doesn't have all of the quote because of the, uh, the bar on top of it, I'll just read that uh, the key part, what he was looking for was a way of solving the motions of the heavens with fewer and much simpler constructions that were formerly used. And of course, as well as allowing the earth to spin, what had been suggested a century and a half earlier by an alchemist scholar, he put the sun at the center and found that was much simpler still. Suddenly an awful lot of the motions of the heavens were stilled if you considered that the earth was just one of the five planets. They can only see, there are only five visible planets and we only try to account for those. So instead of having them twirling around on Ptolemy's wheels within wheels, he just had them on spheres which went once around the sun um, with the moon of course revolving around the earth. And this shows the simplicity of the system compared to the Ptolemaic. On the left-hand side is the uh, orbit of Venus from a geocentric, no, sorry, from a heliocentric perspective. So it's where the sun is at the center of this orbit. On the right is the orbit of Venus from a um, geocentric perspective. 
So the sun is that dot, white dot, and the, all the rest of what you're seeing is the way that you imagine Venus is traveling around the sky to account for its motions in the sky. So you can see it's much more complicated. Once you put the sun at the center, everything simplifies. This is what Copernicus re recognized, and his only argument for his heliocentric system was its simplicity, because his system actually was no better at predicting the motions of the planets than Ptolemy's uh, geocentric system, but it was a lot simpler. So his argument for geocentricity was based on simplicity. Kepler's arguments for his system were also based on simplicity, although his system was better at predicting the motions as well. So Kepler, of course, allowed the, instead of the orbits being in perfect circles, as in Copernicus's, he bent them into ellipses. And then he found that everything worked that much better. And nature loves simplicity and unity. Often a single cause will produce many effects. So he was again inspired by this simplicity that William of Ockham had adopted and all subsequent scientists picked up Ockham's razor. And of course, Johannes Kepler went on to provide another form of simplification. Instead of just bending the ellipses and looking at the, and fitting all of this to the motions that he saw in the heavens, he discovered laws. He discovered this, his three laws of orbital motion. And I won't go through them, but one of them is that planets travel in ellipses, equal areas in the same time, and so on and so forth. But again, he dis so he discovered these as a way of making the system even simpler because they apply to all of the planets, not just one of them that he could calculate these for. Once you knew these laws, you could predict not only the motion of all of the planets, but you could, if you imagine God plopping, dropping another planet into the system, then you could predict its motion as well. It was universal. So the laws provide a greater simplification because they um, apply to a lot more objects. Kepler's, but these only applied in the heavens. Kepler's laws only applied in the heavens. So there are simplification and laws are always a simplification of, of observations, but they only applied in the heavens. And then Galileo came along and discovered laws that apply on Earth, universal acceleration and gravity and Galileo relativity. And again, he argued from a simplicity perspective, supported by a very true maxim of Aristotle, which teaches us that more causes are in vain when fewer suffice. In fact, Aristotle didn't say that. Uh, William of Ockham did. And, um, but at the time, William of Ockham was still a highly controversial figure, particularly in the Catholic world, uh, because he had accused the Pope of being a heretic, remember, and he was excommunicated for that. So you couldn't really mention him as you know, your mentor in, in simplicity. And then um, that wasn't, uh, then uh, Newton, of course, truth is ever to be found in simplicity and not in the multiplicity and confusion of things. And he came up with these three universal laws of motion. So whereas Kepler's laws applied in the heavens, Galileo's laws applied in the terrestrial world, Newton's laws applied in both places. So there are a huge simplification. Up till that point, the heavens were a completely different sphere where different laws applied than on Earth. They were thought to be made out of a different element, the ether or quintessence, which wasn't present on Earth. But Newton said, no, there actually a single set of laws can be applied both on, in the heavens and on Earth, such as Newton's third law that when the push and pushes, the equal and opposite force will push back. And again, his argument was that it was simpler. Once you accepted these laws, then everything was simpler. They applied both on earth and in the heavens. And again, so it appears to me that the matter, of, oh yes, so 
this idea that the matter, that matter in the heavens is uh, operates under the same law, William Rockham had predicted this back in the uh, around 1320. It appears to me that the matter in the heavens is of the same kind as the matter here below. And this is because plurality should never be posited beyond necessity. So he used his razor to say, why do we think it's different up in the heavens? It's probably the same as the stuff down on earth. Again, that was a remarkable insight in the 14th century. How did things go on from there? Well, uh, Newton's laws apply to mechanical objects, they apply to the heavens, but people like Robert Boyle started to use laws to uncover the motions of hidden or hidden motions of molecular structures. Well, they didn't know about molecules and atoms, really, or he did have an idea about atoms, and he proposed that pressure was caused by the motion of atoms. So here he was applying laws down to the hidden dynamics going on inside matter and applying laws to the microscopic realm. And again, he was inspired by simplicity. A part of the true philosophers has been to reduce the true principles of things to the smallest number they can without making them insufficient. Essentially, Occam's razor used the simplest solutions for any problem. And of course, do you reckon if uh, this is what uh, Boyle was famous for his uh, vacuum pumps? And he did a lot of experiments in pressing gases, etc., and uh, evacuating um, um, uh, vessels. And this was the inspiration, of course, of um, of engines. First of all, steam engines, and uh, also internal combustion engines work on these principles. Once you understand how pressure works, how volume works, and gases, then you can build engines to drive the Industrial Revolution. And that was really worked out by using laws, the simplest possible laws, to account for the maximum number of observations, Occam's razor. And this was, of course, worked out not only by Boyle, but uh, Boltzmann, Maxwell, Gibbs, etc. And then, of course, one of the most startling unifications. So these are all kind of unifications, finding out that the heavens worked under the same kind of laws as terrestrial um, mechanics and that uh, internal mechanics, if you like, gases and the uh, and heat, etc., also worked according to the same laws. And then Einstein, so a few centuries later, of course, came up with the idea that space and time were really the same thing. An extraordinary idea, one we're still getting used to, that gravity and acceleration are the same thing. Again, these are simplifications. You think there are two or more things and somebody says, no, they're actually the same thing. And again, Einstein's inspiration was simplicity. Nature is a realization of the simplest conceivable mathematical ideas. Now we're gonna have a little bit of a of a look, a deeper look at simplicity and ask um, how it went into the, um, how it became particle physics, essentially modern particle physics. And we, to do that, we have to understand a little bit about symmetry, that symmetry is really simplicity at heart. And we can see this if we look at a non-symmetrical butterfly. If you look at a non-symmetrical butterfly, if you look at one half of it, it doesn't predict what the other half is like. Whereas if you look at a symmetrical butterfly, if you look at one half, you know the complete butterfly. So symmetries make things simpler because once you know one part of a symmetry, you know the other half of it. Symmetries were then fundamental to Emmy Noether's um, conservation, uh, symmetry and conservation laws. And she showed that the conservation laws like the conservation of energy, conservation of angular momentum were due to symmetries that essentially that rotational symmetry, if the laws of physics are going to be the same, if you rotate, if you rotate to point, if you do an experiment in one direction and you do the same experiment pointing in another direction, if the laws of physics are always going to be the same, if you've got that symmetry, then you get the conservation of angular momentum. Similarly, if the laws of physics are going to be the same in time, then you get the conservation of energy. So Emmy Noether discovered these conservation laws, which became fundamental to particle physics. 
and let eventually, through a long series of, uh, of uh, startling and um, brilliant insights into the standard model of particle physics, which is incredibly simple in the sense that everything in our universe can be explained with only this number of particles. It's really just a group of six quarks, or six leptons, and the force carrying particles of the Higgs boson. Everything follows from the dynamics of these particles. Once you've got the physics of these particles, then everything else follows. And that's an extraordinarily, uh, extraordinarily powerful simplification. And what have I got here? I can't remember what I was going to say here. Oh, the Higgs, but the Higgs boson was, um, uh, I won't go into the details of it, but the Higgs boson was essentially predicted on the basis of simplicity, looking for the simplest solution to problems in physics. Uh, Higgs came up with, well, if it's the simplest way of understanding this problem, then you need to have a Higgs boson. And the Higgs boson was then, of course, discovered. But the microphone's cutting in and out a bit again. Okay, how about, uh, okay, I'll hold to my to um, my mouth like this, and let's see if that works okay. How, how is that at the moment? Fine at the moment, thanks. Okay, so uh, this is the, um, uh, the equations of particle physics that underlie the um, standard model. As you can see, they're very simple. They can be written on the side of a mug. So now, so why is simplicity so useful is the question I want to ask. The Occam's razor has been extraordinarily useful in science. And why is it so useful? Um, and I want to give you two answers, okay? Uh, what time are we going to do the time? I think we're okay. So the first answer is that it's part of Bayesian inference. Bayesian inference is uh, really fundamental to science now. Everything in science from economics to uh, statistical mechanics to um, computer algorithms and, um, um, and epidemiology of, uh, of uh, say, COVID. They use Bayesian models, and Bayesian models has within it the factor called likelihood. Now, I'm going to, I'm going to illustrate likelihood with uh, dice to understand, because I'm, I'm going to try to get you to understand what Bayesian inference is, which is, as I said, fundamental to science. Uh, and it incorporates Occam's razor because of this factor called the likelihood, which is the likelihood of generating the data given a model. So we're going to be applying Bayesian inference to two to a simple problem. I've got two dice here. One's a normal six-sided dice, and the other is a 60-sided dice. Now I will throw one of these dice and ask you to guess which dice have I thrown. So I'll throw one, okay, and I tell you the uh, number is 43, okay? I ask you which dice do, have I thrown? Of course, the answer is simple. It's, it's got to be the, the big dice, the one which has 43 on it. The other one doesn't have 43. So in Bayesian interfere inference, you start off with a prior, a prior probability of, a system, of, an, of uh, a, uh, an answer. And uh, the prior probability of each of these dice is 0.5. It could be either. And then you uh, multiply it by the likelihood, which is the likelihood of generating the data given the model. So the likelihood of this dice throwing a 43 is zero. The likelihood of this dice throwing a 43 is 160. So this is obviously much higher than zero. So in that case, the answer is simple. It's got to be the, um, the, uh, the big dice. Now I throw them again, and I say the, uh, the number that's come up is five, okay? Now, which is it? The prize are the same, so we can say that it's 50% chance I threw the prior probability, it's a 50% chance that you threw the big dice and 50% the small dice, but now the number I've got, five, could, be, could have been thrown by either dice. Is the probability the same? Or is it different? Okay. Okay, I thought I had the equation here, but I don't. But never mind. The likelihood is the key. And the likelihood 
is the probability of generating the data given the model. Now, what's with 60 sided dice, what's the probability I would have thrown a five? It's always 60. Okay. With the six sided dice, what's the probability I would have thrown a five? It's one in six. So you multiply in Bayesian inference, you multiply the prior 0.5, which is the same for both, with the likelihood, which is the likelihood that the model that you've got would have given you the data that you've observed. And then it's one in 60 for this, uh, sorry, one in 60 for the, uh, for the complicated dice and one in six for the simple dice. So in Bayesian reasoning, it's 10 times more likely that I've thrown a five, even though you don't know which one I've thrown on the basis of I could have thrown either of them with a 50% likelihood, but Bayesian inference will come to the conclusion that it's 10 times more likely you've thrown the small dice. Basically, that's all Bayesian inference is. It's prior times Occam's razor gives you the answer. And Bayesian inference is the basis of so many things in science nowadays. So basically what I'm claiming is it's the basis of most of science. It's based on the Bayesian inference idea that you take the simplest explanation because it's more, the simpler model is more likely to generate your data. And, um, and that's really what the argument was for um, heliocentricity, that the simple model and the complicated geocentric model could both account for the data in the heavens, at least in Copernicus's observations. But he opted for the simpler because it, his intuition was, was, of course, this is well before Thomas Bayes came up with Bayesian inference. But his intuition was, was that if you had a simpler system that accounted for the observations, that was preferred. That is more likely to have generated your data than the more complicated one. Essentially, the more complicated one can account for a lot more data. It's got much greater flexibility, whereas the simpler models are more fragile. They, can, they haven't got so many knobs to tweak. So if you do find your data matches their predictions, then it's much more likely that they are the source of your data than the more complicated model. And so much of science is based on that. And that's really what an awful lot of science is about. Uh, and the universe has turned out to be stunningly simpler. It's, it's simple. It's simpler than any of our models can explain. To the therapy, the astrophysicist. And in um, all of science, um, you know, we have the same preference for simplicity. So that's really what, what science, I believe, is based on. So natural selection simply uh, also outside of physics um, sciences or also uses simplicity. Natural selection and creation could both be used to explain everything on our, all the biological, all the biosphere, but natural selection is simpler. It starts off with a simple rule of natural selection, competition, and everything else follows. Creationism, you've got creationists, you've got to have a creator that's going to make every single species on the planet, uh, all the you know, a trillion or so different species, much more complicated. Natural selection says you just need a star, the first self-replicator, and everything else follows. Much simpler. And one of the um, co-discoverers of natural selection, Alfred Russell Wallace, the theory of natural selection itself, it's exceedingly simple. And the facts on which it rests come under a few simple and very easily understood classes. Scientists have always been impressed by simplicity. Okay, another way of looking at this is if you consider a simple law, like our, a Newton's third law, when um, for every action there is an equal or opposite reaction. That's the simplest way of explaining a phenomenon, but it isn't the only way. There could be another law, which for every action and react, every action there is an equal and opposite reaction plus a demon also pushing the box from the other side. And then another law, there's two demons. And then another law, there's three demons and four demons and five demons and so on. What Newton said was, let's get rid of all of these demons and just go for the simplest laws. Truth is ever to be found in simplicity, not in the multiplicity and confusion of things. So he went for the simplest laws. And it's true for every observation that we make 
There are simple explanations and there's an infinite number of complex explanations. Science is really about finding the simple explanations and going for those. Um, okay, so it's got a bit confused, my slides, I'm afraid, but here's the equation I was looking for before, which I won't, uh, as time is running short, we won't um, uh, dwell on it, as I've explained it already. What is science? So what is science? This is Wiki's exploration of science, a systematic enterprise that builds and organizes knowledge in the form of testable explanations and predictions about the world. Nonsense. Could be applied for anything. Could be applied to cooking. It's a systematic enterprise that builds and organizes knowledge in the form of testable explanations, how, what things taste of, how you mix them together to make a good dish, and you make those predictions to cook. It could be used about alchemy. Alchemists had, had uh, built and no, organized knowledge to make testable explanations and predictions about the world. It can be applied to astrology, everything it could be applied to. So it doesn't explain anything. What is science, I would say? Systematic en enterprise that uses logic, mathematics, and experiment. All of those are used by astrologers and alchemists to identify their simplest models of the world. This is what the astrologers and alchemists don't do. To identify the simplest models of the world that provide the most accurate and general predictions. And this is what simple models do. So what I'm saying is science is really all about finding the simplest solution. Use mathematics to find simple solu solutions, use experiment to find simple solutions, but ultimately that's what it's about. And that's what is different about science compared to every other way of making sense of the world. Science is about simplicity. There may be another, why is Occam's razor useful? So a Bayesian inter inference may be part of it, but there's another possible explanation, which is kind of intriguing and more open-ended. And we'll, just in the last few minutes, we'll go through this, that the universe may be simple. It may be sim as simple as it could be, consistent with our, our, um, our existence. So the universe may be built on simple rules. And um, be through that. Okay, principle of least action, for example. Um, it's a way of understanding the motion. Instead of using Newtonian laws, you can understand motion according to the principle of least action. And it really takes the simplest path from getting from A to B, although it's actually the one that conserves the action. And the action is, is, the, uh, is, a, um, is a physical, it's a combination of the uh, object's energy, um, both kinetic and, um, um, and potential energy. And by conserving that, if you conserve the action in motion, then you get the path that objects take. So the principle of least action seems to suggest that the universe is doing the least. It, it, it's, it's a lazy universe, as Jennifer Coppersmith Copper suggested, that the universe uses the simplest path to get from one place to another. Um, as I've argued already, the standard model is pretty darn simple. You need all of the, all of these uh, different um, uh, neutrinos, electrons, up quarks, down quarks, in order to make the universe uh, that we inhabit, in order to make us. We need all of those. Even things like neutrinos, which seem to be pretty useless when you think about them, the neutrinos are the most numerous uh, particles in the universe, Trillions of them are passing through your body every second. They hardly interact with anything else. So you think about, it. so if you think about them, you think, why? Well, why do we have them? Surely they're they're um, not. They are entities beyond the system. You don't need neutrinos. In fact, you do. If you wouldn't have star. I won't go into the details, but you wouldn't have starlight without neutrinos. The universe, as we see it, couldn't have existed without neutrinos. Similarly, even mysterious um, uh, materials such as dark matter, which we know exists as uh, in, in, in many places, the universe are dominated by dark matter. It's dark, it doesn't interact with light, it's far away from us. Why do we need it? In fact, we need it to form galaxies. Without dark matter, galaxies wouldn't have formed or would have formed much slower. 
So even stuff that don't we don't seem to interact with, like neutrinos and dark matter, are necessary for our world. So my argument is that the universe is close to being as simple as it could be to generate us, which I think is something of a puzzle. If that is the case, why should it be so simple? The idea I give in, in, in my book, Life is Simple, is actually borrowing an idea from Lee Smolin, cosmological natural selection, that the universe has evolved. There may be trillions of universes and universes are constantly being born through black holes. This is Lee Smolin's idea, not mine, but it could explain, and there's not time to go into it, why it is that the universe we inhabit seems to be as simple as it could possibly be. Occam's razor in daily life, you know, why, <laughs> how is it useful? Um, fake news, pseudoscience, conspiracy theories, they can be defeated always with simplicity. So simply, if you have simplicity at your hand, you can use, you can make better sense of the world. Um, and one of the easiest ways of doing it is compare the length of explanations. If you want to explain COVID, for example, say, well, it came, it's a virus that came from a bat and infected humans, you can say it that way, nice and simple, or you could come up with a very complex conspiracy theory to explain COVID. And it's, it's going to be much more complicated. It's going to be, take you a long time to explain this conspiracy theory. What the pocket razor um, does, this is what I suggest everyone does in looking at explanations, is choose the one that's simplest, the easiest to say, the shortest. And that's usually going to be the one that's true. Uh, so this is all part of my, uh, so, um, William said, my latest book, Life is Simple. Um, published uh, late last year, and um, and that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, John Joe. It's been a fascinating view of the whole development of science, I guess, from ancient times through a steady progression to modern times. Uh, it'd be good to get some questions into the chat. From everyone we're not going to take a break this time we're just assuming you're okay to go ahead um we're just going to crack on with that and uh we can take questions in the uh, chat on youtube as well while people are having a think about that um certainly the uh when you were talking about in medieval times that uh, theology was the oh sorry uh was the queen or something queen um, of sciences theology was the queen yes, of sciences yes. um that that that's that's what i was trying to get to yeah i think that was um a principle maintained by the university of winchester until probably into the present century where they had a theology <laughs> department really but nothing you would really consider to be a science department um oh, wow. okay. i think that owes it, its origins to that uh, way well, it's, it would have been a very ancient university, I guess, Winchester. No, it's so, not a very ancient university. Oh, really? It's quite a recent university. Okay. It was um, a 19th century theological college. Okay, so, I see. Okay. Catholic one? Sorry? Catholic, uh, Catholic college? Uh, I think Anglican. Anglican, um, okay. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, wouldn't have been Aquinas anymore, I guess, but still <laughs> theology was, uh, um, uh, was dominant. In the, yeah. In the um, Anglican world, yes. Yes, yeah. Wesleyan College. Okay. Was it? Okay, I was, I was going to say. That's where its formation came from. And um, uh, it didn't need a budget uh, to be a Wesleyan College because the Wesleyan move, would, movement would just support it. Uh, that's led them, that philosophy has led them into some um, financial problems in the last, uh, shall we say, 50, 50 years okay. or less. Yeah. Okay. Um, do you want to unshare your screen, John Joe, and then we? Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah. Let's see. Sure. Yeah, um, the the other <coughs> question, which was um, in my mind, what you're saying, you're talking about. Um, he was saying that you know that that science and theology were distinct. But what term did he use? Because I thought science came in as a term sort of more in the 18th century. Scientia. 
Um, scientia was um, knowledge, um, scientific knowledge. So um, the medieval theologians did distinguish between um, things that were known for certain, which they called scientia. So, you know, like Paris was the capital of France, something that was known for certain, the horses had teeth, things that were known for certain. So theology was one of them. So it was part of scientia. And scientia then branched off into science, the things that could, were known for certain, and theology, the things that weren't known for certain, after all. Uh, okay, right, thank you. <clears throat> and uh, we had a question on YouTube saying, are there any examples that you know of in science where the universe has made things more complicated than necessary from Simon? Um, well, the universe is, of course, extraordinarily complicated. A uh, question that uh, we have to address, I suppose, is could it be any simpler? I mean, we've got billions of stars out there. But a uh, strange thing is, if you take all the matter of the universe and uh, all the energy of the universe and put it all together with the gravitational force of the universe, it adds up to zero. And that's really weird as well. And if you like, they, they, if you compare everything together, you get nothing. And what's simpler than nothing? And that's kind of extraordinary as well. Um, but it is, at the moment, it's a complicated place. But could it be any simpler if we didn't have, um, if we, um, we could imagine just the sun and the earth, but we couldn't get the earth without having all of the dynamics of, of uh, the, um, of the uh, uh, of the stars, previous generations of stars that generated heavy heavy uh, um, elements such as carbon, etc. The cosmos had to be have been around for billions of years, generating these heavy elements that we need for life before we got here. So there's complexity in the universe, but as far as I can see, it's kind of necessary. And uh, certainly, the, you know, the biosphere is hugely complex. But it's built on simple principles. Everything can be explained on the basis of natural selection. So, which is about as simple as an idea can, can, can be. I suppose there's um, an interesting student's paradox that as we move beyond the Dalton model of the atom or um, towards a quantum one or the uh, move from Newtonian physics to um, relativistic physics maybe a simpler de definition but it's a dance like harder to understand and study it as you go it on. is i mean it is a kind of hard to get your head around now i saw one of the questions that popped up is quantum mechanics simple no it is simple i i don't really understand quantum mechanics it's a difficult although you can write it as a single equation but i don't understand that but if you ask quantum physicists is it simple? Uh, what I would say was, if you try to explain the universe and things like, you know, the motion of, of atoms, the motion of particles of matter, without quantum mechanics, it would be a whole lot harder. Mm. Quantum mechanics is the simplest explanation of things like the, um, the, uh, the motion of electrons in atoms, the um, even things like the sun, you can't really explain the sun shining without quantum mechanics. So if you get rid of quantum mechanics, the world becomes more complex in different ways. Mm. So yes, it's hard for me to get my head around quantum mechanics, I don't really get my head around it properly, but the world would be harder without it, harder to understand without it. Similarly, um, uh, general relativity, uh, again, physicists and mathematicians describe the general relativity equations as being most beautiful and by that in mathematics they always mean simple and the most beautiful objects mathematical objects is the general relativity equations so mathematicians see uh, simplicity there we see them hard but phenomena such as black holes don't make any sense without it mm. so if you try to work without those the hard but simple ideas like quantum mechanics and general relativity, then the world is a whole lot more complicated. We have two people with their hands raised, and confusingly, they're both called Robert, but we'll take Mr. Stovold first. 
You want to unmute? Yeah, just unmuting. Yes, thank thank you very much for the talk. I thought it was um, brilliant, and I'm uh, already a sort of uh, fan of uh, Occam's Razor. So okay. yeah, it's interesting to learn more about it. I mean, it's more a que uh, this is what I've got to say is more of a follow up of, about an earlier question uh, about complexity. Now, natural selection is a very simple mechanism, and uh, natural selection and mutation. She was in a small mutation and um, natural selection, which is simply sort of adapting things to their environment. But it can result in very complicated um, arrangements. And that's actually one of the arguments against a creator. So, you know, could you imagine a simpler way of getting a human? Well, human adults don't have much of a tail. So you'd, you'd think if you were designing a human adult from scratch, simply don't grow a tail. But what happens is the human embryo grows a tail and then selectively reabsorbs it, which uh, which is very unsimple in a in a way you know you would never design it that way. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So there's an example of of how we are more complicated than we need. Yeah. To. And but indeed, we can make I sense of it through evolution because yeah. it wasn't overseen by anything with foresight. Yeah. And, you know, you'd never have a, a, an organism growing a tail and then reabsorbing it if God's purpose for it was not to have a tail, you know, it's, it would be downright perverse. Um, yeah, I, I agree. And yeah. um, that um, uh, living organisms are complicated and often overly complicated. Uh, we men have nipples. <laughs> we don't use them for anything useful, but they're there presumably for developmental reasons that we, that we um, uh, can't get around, that there are developmental reasons that makes it easier for us to develop both males and females if we men keep our nipples. So there's lots of complexity that is kind of accidental, um, but I still think that um, we're about as simple as we can be to fill our ecological niche. And that's a more complicated argument, and I do go into more detail in the book, but um, I think uh, to kind of, um, to get a feeling for how simplicity can work in uh, biology, think about where we are now in the pandemic. The whole world has been brought to its knees by one of the simplest objects we know, a hundred nanometer sphere, you know, a thousandth or a millionth the size of a full stop has brought the entire world, the entire human world to its knees. How can you get more simple than that? So simplicity is still powerful. It's brought us all to the state we're in, that we've been in there now for nearly two years, a simple biological object. So simplicity can still beat the complex objects like us. And this is, I think, one of the things we face, that simplicity does have that driver. If you can find a simpler solution, then it, uh, it tends to be very powerful. Indeed. And Mr. Clifford, in turn. Uh, yeah. Um, one of the things that interests me is education. Uh, and I think I was reading recently that America and the UK are lagging in many respects in terms of education for science and maths. And I wonder partly whether that's because we don't teach this um, idea of simplicity and that the simplest solutions are often the best ones. Yeah. Uh, why in America there's so much in the way of, you know, these conspiracy theories, because people haven't really been taught how to think. Yeah, I completely agree. And actually, it is something I've been thinking about a lot lately in, in terms of um, science. And uh, the problem that we have, I mean, I, was, I, I teach science and I was taught science. And the problem we have, I think, for making science attractive is doesn't have a centralizing, a core kind of idea the way we teach it. We teach us a bunch of tricks. There's experiment, there's maths, there's a few logical rules and stuff like that. But it's not as if something that you can grasp. So I don't think it appeals to children because they can't grasp it really. It's just a bunch of tricks that we use to try to make sense of the world. If we instead said to um, young people that, look, there's these ways that you can try to make sense of the world, like theology, philosophy, mysticism, etc., or there's another way where you take the simplest solution to problem and we talk to problems and we call that science. That's all there is to science. Everything else is an add-on. I think that would be a much more powerful way to get uh, young people interested in science if they can get their head around. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Just take the simplest solution 
and now I can do science. That's all it needs to do science. The other stuff like the experiments, knowing how many elements there are and things like that, they're add-ons. Basically, all I need to do is find out how I find the simplest solution to problems. And that's really what science ought to be about. In terms of teaching science, how do you get to the simplest solutions? And I think that's a better way of getting to the, um, getting science, uh, um, young people interested in science and taking more, uh, and driving science education um, more effectively through all the conspiracy theories, etc. cetera. Uh, yeah, awesome. simplicity. I, I, did read, I did read somewhere that if we taught kids how to read, in the same or to speak in the same way as we teach in schools we'd just be teaching them to make us as long utterances of uh, sounds without any you know reason for it just make this set of sounds and that's fine you know just remember sequences of sounds not what their meaning is yeah yeah the meaning of science is simplistic and i think that if, be, if people understood that and I think it will be a lot easier to get over what science is all about and make it attractive. Indeed, yes. And uh, Symes also asked, did Occam stand on the shoulders of another giant for his ideas? Or is that, or does history not record? <laughs> well, um, he's extraordinarily um, prolific in, in first ideas, as far as I know. He, as I said, he's the first person to clearly separate science from religion. He wasn't the first person to have some preference for uh, simple solutions, as um, um, you know, other philosophers in the past did have a preference, but they didn't take them very far. For example, Aristotle did say things like, you know, nature, um, nature doesn't do things, uh, nature doesn't do anything it doesn't need to. But then he invented universals and invented teleological causes, etc. So he wasn't, although he had a, um, a, a verbal presence for uh, a preference for simplicity in terms of his philosophy, it wasn't simple. He created lots of excessive stuff that was that Occam got rid of. So, and that was why several centuries later, the principle of simplicity is named after William of Occam, not Aristotle or anyone else, because that's what he was famous for, and that's what changed science forever, the principle of simplicity. Before that, if you want to explain the motion of, a, of a, an object in the heavens, you put an angel behind it or a devil behind it. You just threw an extra entity at it. That was the way you did science. You threw universals, you threw teleological causes and things. And Occam said, no, get rid of all of those and try to just explain them with the stuff we have in front of our eyes. And that was how science and pulled itself out of this confusion of theology and science that was the medieval world. And rounding out the, the earlier comment I made about the, um, the, the, the University in Winchester not having a science department, and you asked if that was a, an ancient institution. Of course, what we do have in Winchester is an ancient institution uh, that was established as a theological college. Um, which was Winchester College itself. Um, okay. And we recently <laughs> were extremely fortunate to have a visit to the, the fellows library there, where they have an extraordinary collection of some really ancient and original science books and manuscripts. Wow, okay. And the college goes back to, I think the 14th century and some of the um, original works that they have there uh, just are absolutely extraordinary. I'm some sort of contemporary, even earlier than that. Um, mm. They were well, built up even to um, teach the boys. They were the they were the fellows, the the staffs, own books. Um, okay. Most of them would have had very few books themselves, um, mm. and. Yeah. They were then bequeathed to the college, and uh, I think they said they've got something like ten or fifteen percent of the books they had mm. originally had, sort of back in the Middle Ages. Uh, that, okay, fantastic! Mm. Quite an extraordinary survival rate. Yeah, well, the cathedral schools were the predecessors of universities in the West. Um, first scholars, the medieval, early medieval scholars before the universities came along, were taught in cathedral schools. Of course, Winchester is a very ancient cathedral. 
um, yeah. did have a teaching establishment there within the cathedral. And William of Wickham um, was a, a former Bishop of Winchester who founded the college just outside the, the cathedral close. And uh, in fact, yeah. it remained a, with royalist sympathies, um, right up to and after the Civil War. So, um, okay. had mm. influential Interesting. supporters, yeah. Um, somebody's posted something in which I can't quite make out, so I think we'll have to pass over that one. But um, lots of uh, very positive and favourable comments in in the comments about uh, how much people have enjoyed the talk as well. So, thank you, uh, Professor John Joe McFadden. Thank you very much for um, sharing your your book and your thoughts with us. Um, book is, I'm sure, available through local booksellers as well as um international online ones uh, to, <laughs> according to your presence assuming you're not actually um uh selling yourself through your your own website which <laughs> think no <is> no <laughs> buy, buy them buy where you like indeed excellent well thank thanks again very much and um thank you for inviting me thank you bye now bye bye thank you bye